Hello, hello, and welcome back to Trying to Figure It Out. I'm Allie, and I'm very excited for this week's episode. Joining me this week is a Harvard Business School grad, a Netflix star, a manners expert, and an Etiquette Institute founder. Sarah Jane Ho, welcome to Trying to Figure It Out. Thank you, Allie. Thank you for having me here. I'm very excited for our conversation today. So we are going to talk about so many things. First off, your book is coming out in April and it is called Mind Your Manners. I want to hear all about the book. We're going to get there. We're not going to dive in yet on the book. But first things first, what is etiquette? What I've been trying to do the last 10 years since I founded an etiquette school in China and have come out with my show is I'm trying to redefine etiquette where, you know, it's... A lot of people think it's rigid, it's one big don't, right? It's like limiting, it's you know a middle-aged lady with her hair in a bun who's teaching it. But actually, to me, etiquette is one big do. It's about enabling you, empowering, to, empowering you to get what you want, to say what you want, to set the boundaries you want to set mm-hmm. uh, in a way that doesn't offend people, right? So it's all about delivery. So, But I would say that etiquette really is making other people feel comfortable around you, putting them at ease. Yeah. I'm not trying to teach morality. Right. I'm not trying to be higher than thou and tell you how to be a good person. I'm just trying to tell you what you should do in different situations that will make you belong Mm -hmm. and make you put other people at ease and therefore make you feel comfortable with different people. So etiquette is basically a set of social norms and rules and manners to help you navigate social situations. Yes. Got it. Okay, so... I want to get a little bit of your background. How did you get into the space? In 2012, when I graduated from Harvard Business School and moved to Beijing to start this, China was going through a very interesting um, journey where it was becoming a global power. And I often say that there's no other country like China that has gone through so much change in such a short amount of time. I mean, my etiquette students who, who were adults, I teach ladies, not kids, They tell me that when they grew up in the 60s and the 70s, on their birthday, their mother would give them an egg. I mean, you know, the whole country was extremely poor. And now they have all these newfound riches after China opened up economically in 1978. And then, you know, by in the 1990s and by the 2000s, you had a lot of sort of very affluent people. And these affluent people needed to know how to move through the world and their new social life with confidence. Mm -hmm. So that was the business opportunity I identified. And then on a a more personal note, I grew up with my mom being a role model. She was, to me, she was an incredible hostess because she knew what to do with everybody in every situation. Our home was really warm. She was always inviting people over for dinners, for Christmas would be dozens of people at our house. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I lost to cancer when I was 21. I'm sorry to hear that. And, but you know, it's funny, I still talk about it as though she's alive sometimes. So my life really changed. You know, I, my, I'm an only child. Um, my dad didn't entertain in the same way on his own. And my life became really lonely. My home became really empty. But then I realized actually, and I'm a Sagittarius, I'm very, I love being around friends and, and organizing things. But I realized, you know, I could, maybe I could combine what I loved with what my mother taught me and then continue her legacy Absolutely. through opening a finishing school in China. That's amazing. Well, thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. How important were manners and etiquette in your childhood? I Have you heard of the phrase tiger mom? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, for basically all Chinese kids, when that book came out, the Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mom, we're like, ah, this, <laughs> we, this is something that like now we can identify with. Yeah. And that we like, we're like, now we can put a name to, mm-hmm. to our upbringing. A tiger mom is someone who is so demanding and so strict of her child yeah. that it causes for a pretty unhappy childhood. And especially in Hong Kong, mothers are very demanding and like, you know, they like perfection and they, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually tough on children. Of course. So my mom was very strict. She, it was very much, if we were having a meal with family or family friends, she would be kicking me under the table, motioning, oh, you know, so-and-so's teacup is empty. You should refill it. Mm-hmm. Right, all these little things, and actually, these all made me very sensitive to my surroundings. Yeah. So that even, let's say, if I'm in a conversation this way, I can see who's bored, who's playing on their phone, right? Who's who's shy, who needs attending to, at the same time. Yeah. And and this was very much what my mother instilled in me, for sure. So after you attended Harvard Business School, you founded Institute Sarita. Can you tell me a little bit more about it and what it offers? 
Our course is called a hostess course. We actually have a hostess course for married women and a debutante course for mm -hmm. unmarried women. Sometimes we'll have mother and hostess and, and her daughter and debutante. No, but uh, generally speaking, so, so the hostess course is much more about how to entertain. It's more about like taking on a proactive role as you know, matriarch of your household, uh, organizing events, social etiquette, dining, dressing, all these things. The debutante course is more about how to be a guest, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of them may be still in college or just graduated and how do they sort of enter society and, and make a good first impression, right? As they're going about their starting their career or starting their you know, new social life. Right. Things like etiquette and finishing schools may seem outdated to younger generations. So why do you continue to advocate for them? And why do you think that they're still important? Etiquette, I feel, is really the glue that holds society together. Mm -hmm. And society, belonging, is what makes us human. For sure. I feel that every day I open the newspaper and I read some story about of epic rudeness or even violence, right? Um, of I see online abuse. I see cancel culture. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of workplace bullying. And even our statesmen don't act like statesmen anymore. Yeah. So it's <laughs> very true. And but then I feel that maybe you know that's it, it needed to get this bad in order for people to realize and bring bring etiquette back. And I think that if you, especially like in this this year and last year, mm -hmm. you see etiquette coming back into the narrative. For example, New York Magazine and Curbed they had a whole etiquette. Thing that did really well and now Vogue magazine is launching an etiquette column called mm -hmm. Oh Behave and I think that you know sometimes things do have to near breaking point for people to realize okay like we need to bring this back for sure what would etiquette like on your in your opinion look like in the U.S. versus what you like a finishing school in the U.S. what would that like what mm. would be taught there versus what is taught in Beijing or in any other place I always say etiquette is contextual. So for example, giving and receiving gifts. In Asia, if I give you a gift, you would not open it in front of me because that would be considered greedy, that you had no self-control. You would even put it aside. You wouldn't make a fuss of it. You'd wait till I leave and, and then you'd open it. But in, in America, if I give you a gift and you did that, that would be very rude. You'd be showing no respect. Yeah. In America, if I gave you a gift, you would open it in front of me, make a big fuss of it, talk about how much you love it, right? That's very true. And so these things are contextual. And so I often say it really depends on where you are or who you're with. And, and in my book, actually, I, I talk about how I approach etiquette as a microcultural anthropologist. Mm -hmm. My favorite course at Georgetown was studying anthropology. And because I've lived in so many different countries as well, mm -hmm. anthropology is about the study of human behavior. So every time I go into, you know, I meet a different person or a different group of people or, you know, and, he, and you can go through many microcultures in one day in LA alone. Absolutely. Right? Even I'm sure music industry is very different from yeah. like other industries. And as soon as I meet someone, I'm thinking, okay, what are the codes of conduct here? Right? Like what is the slang being used? What mm -hmm. even like, what are their accents? What are they wearing? Right. And, and then sort of subconsciously adopting it, adjusting myself. Yeah so that you feel comfortable around me and therefore I feel comfortable around you. For sure. It's so interesting. I, I'm i loving this conversation because <laughs> I just feel like I'm learning a lot and I feel like my listeners too. I think it's, it's not even necessarily that it's an outdated topic. I just don't think it's really like talked about enough. I don't think people are thinking about it enough. I think people, you know, learn to mind their P's and Q's and have good manners and say thank you and put their napkin on their lap. But there's so much more to it and it's so important to have that in the world i think it's totally. missing it's really it, it, missing. It, you're right it's missing and i think especially in america but when you think about like the history of etiquette when people shake hands what's the history of shaking hands it was to show that i don't have arms the weapons that i don't have a gun in my hand right basically uh, when like, sort of clinking glasses where did that tradition come from it was to show that the host when they invited guests to their home didn't poison your alcohol because when we clink glasses, the, I don't know if you've been to Oktoberfest and seen no, how Germans do it, right? <laughs> You're supposed to really do it so that your wine or your beer spills into the other person's cup. God, I didn't know that. And, I did not know that right? at all. And now, of course, we don't do that. We just do a polite, maybe we raise, maybe we clink. Mm -hmm. But back then it was like a full on, you know, my drink is intermingled with your drink. Mm -hmm. And that shows that I'm not poisoning you. Yeah. 
What's your opinion on eye contact when cheersing? Oh, well, I mean, there's a saying that it's if you bad don't, b- bad sex is what I've heard. Oh, wow. Yeah, bad I've sex. I've just heard bad luck. Oh, really? Oh, <laughs> now <yeah>. now I'm, <laughs> that's even more important. <laughs> I've heard like seven years of bad sex, according to German friends. Whoa, but I've ag- never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it's also contextual. So for example, in Korea, if somebody younger than you toasts you, they won't make eye contact with you. So they'll toast and they'll look away. It's very bizarre. I mean, if you're a foreigner and you're experiencing it, it's very bizarre. Yeah. But it's because it's eye contact with a superior, with a senior person older than you or your boss or whatever is considered too aggressive and disrespectful. Wow. Super interesting, right? It's so interesting because I would never know that. Okay. So I want to talk more about your book. Your book is coming out soon. It's called Mind Your Manners. Who is your book for and what do you hope readers will learn from the book? My book is for anybody who's interested in human connection and social connection. And it's structured across five different chapters. So there's family, love and relationships, social life, uh, career, and then there's food and travel. So, and it's, it's a mix of anecdotes, case studies, my personal learnings, some pro tips, mm-hmm. uh, as well as sprinkled with a couple of feng shui tips. Yeah. And, and it's, it's very meaty, it's very practical. And so I, you know, it's really, it's really for any, anybody and everybody interested in social connection. I love that. As you said, the book is divided into five sections. I want to dive into some of these and just get some real life tips about how people can practice etiquette in these spaces. So let's start with friendship and social life. Let's say I'm trying to make friends in a city I just moved to. What are some of the most important things to keep in mind? Yeah, well, if you're a parent, the best way is to be involved with a school, right, that you send your kid to. Yeah. Knowing the other parents. In fact, that is that is probably the easiest way for when a family moves to a new city for the parents to make friends. For sure. And then let's say if you're single, don't be shy about asking people, about calling up a friend or even telling like, telling people you just met saying, oh, I just moved here. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm looking to really engage with the community. Sure. Uh, do you know, you know, what communities I can join? And also hobbies. Let's say if you play tennis, uh, if you like art, right? You can always engage with a museum. You could mm-hmm. be a young member, right? All these things. It's important to put yourself out there. Yeah. I'm really excited about this specific section of the book because I feel like so many people are actively seeking advice on friendship. I think, you know, there's so much out there for dating and there's so much out there to match people together. There's dating apps, there's people setting each other up, but with friendship, there's not really, um, there should be, but there's not really a space for it. That is so true. And one thing I address in the friend chapter is how, what happens when you break up with a friend? Oh, we, right. Because like, what you said just reminded me of like, there's all this stuff on breaking up with your boyfriend or, you know, or divorcing all this stuff. But sometimes when you break up with a friend or you're dropped by a friend or you drop, I mean, that that's real pain too, right? Yeah. Somebody who's been your, a really good friend, seen you through all these boyfriends, like, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's why it was very important for me to, to have this, the social and friend part of the chapter. Absolutely. I'd actually like to talk a little more about that because We've done a lot of talk here about friendship breakups and what it can be like. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you have in here about friendship breakups? Yeah. Uh, well, I, so with friendship, you know, it's it's interesting because it's important to, to know how to set boundaries, just like it's important to have healthy romantic relationships and to know how to identify and get out of toxic romantic relationships. Yeah. It's the same thing with friends. And I do have a lot of Instagram followers who will message me and say, oh, you know, my friend, she's completely draining me. She feels like she owns my time. She drops in unannounced. She always wants to take some of my time on the phone, yeah. right? And and it's like, okay, well, first of all, then this doesn't sound like a very good friend, right? And you have to know how to set boundaries. So it's one thing if she's always trying to take up your time, but how come you're not setting those boundaries yeah. that are pushing her back to protect yourself. Absolutely. And that's what I say, I, why I think etiquette is empowering and enabling. It gives you the courage and the tools of, okay, this is how I express. This is how I set my boundaries. This is how I say, I'm not happy with this, right? And then if that doesn't work, then you should drop this friend. Yeah, so would you say that etiquette 
can be a tool or a resource for someone who struggles with confrontation? Totally. Because when people are afraid of confrontation, a lot of the times they haven't been taught how to confront someone, Mm -hmm. probably because their role models, i.e. their parents, weren't very good at doing that. Yeah. Right. And our parents are role models. Like everything goes back to childhood. So if nobody taught them how to have healthy relationships, how to express discontent, how to set boundaries, they just don't know. Yeah. And from this book, you, it gives you, it's a toolkit. I even have little scripts in there. Yeah. Right. Like what to say, how to, and, and most importantly, your tone and your delivery. For right. Sure. Uh, and, and so it enables you to really, to, to be your full self. Yeah. It's interesting because as a person who does struggle with confrontation, because I'm such a people pleaser, it's very hard for me to be confrontational. I'd rather just like suck it up and continue pleasing others. But then the problem is that you end up feeling resentful. Absolutely. It's interesting because I'm actively looking for tools to fix this about myself. And I, I've gone to therapy and I've done so many different things and I really haven't found the specific tool, but I would have never thought that, you know, a book on etiquette and tools and tips would be something that could help with that. So I think that this is even more relatable than you could ever imagine to my listeners and myself, because we actively talk about these kinds of things here, relationships, family dynamics, all these things. And if etiquette is like a free tool that you can use to better your life and your human interactions, like that's a golden ticket, you know? Yes. I do want to move on to the next section, which is dating and relationships. It's a favorite. Yeah. Everybody's favorite. (laughs) Of course. If I am going on a first date, what are your tips? So my biggest tip for a first date is that you should never go too formal. Because there's already a lot of sort of anxiety and nervousness, right? A lot of expectation. If you go to a fancy restaurant or if you even do dinner necessarily, it could be add a lot more extra pressure on it. Mm -hmm. I like to keep first dates light, casual, maybe get a coffee, maybe take a walk in the park and something where you can control the time. Because if it turns out it becomes very clear the other person is not someone you want to spend time with, you can bow out, right? You can't really bow out of a three course dinner. No, you cannot. (laughs) What about like navigating an argument with your partner? What tips do you have for that? Yeah, that is great. So one of my favorite tips, uh, In fact, it's almost like this, like, it's like a toolkit. We talk about the ladder of inference. So let's say you and your boyfriend are walking together and then there's this, there's this girl who says hi to him and he totally, he talks to her, but he doesn't introduce you guys and doesn't say, doesn't introduce you as his girlfriend, right? Right. And then, you know, leaves, she leaves. A lot of girls would immediately be like, oh, like, you know, why didn't, why didn't you, uh, me <laughs> yeah right it's like it's like oh you clearly you must like her you you don't want her to know you have a go over about my existence or blah, right. blah 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 right jumping to conclusions well ladder of inference would say hang on a second uh firstly you state the facts right which you say hey um this girl came by i don't know her and you just had a conversation with her and you t- totally cut me out of it mm-hmm. right so that's just the facts right nobody can argue with the facts right and then the second step of the latter inference is you say, this is how I interpreted it. So my interpretation of that was, are you, you, you don't want to let people know you have a girlfriend? Are you embarrassed about me? Do you like her? Da, 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 da. Step three of that is to talk about how you feel, mm-hmm. your emotions, and, and to focus only on your emotions. Say, you know, it made me feel hurt. It made me feel ashamed. It made me feel jealous, right? These things. What you don't want to do is you you don't want to accuse him and be like, oh, you know, you're always footing with other girls. Oh, you always this or, oh, you don't, yeah. right? No, you focus on the facts, your interpretation, how it made you feel. And then step four of this ladder of inference is you say, but, you know, why did you do it that way? What was your meaning? For right? sure. And then, you know, maybe he'll say, well, actually, that's my cousin's ex-girlfriend and she's a bitch and screwed him over and yeah. blah, blah, blah. And I don't want to don't know anything about our family, mm-hmm. right? So, and the most important thing is to maintain is, is to be nice, is to sound nice. Yeah. Because that makes a huge difference. Absolutely. It's so easy in a situation like that to just get triggered and instantly pounce. And I think sometimes it's like, take a breath. I think that's absolutely amazing advice. I'm definitely going to keep working on trying to take it. <laughs> it takes a lot of practice. Absolutely. So, you know, you, you won't perfect it the first time, but then you'll try it the second time. And then, you know, and by, you know, the eighth time, you'll be a pro. 
Absolutely. And it just creates a space too for that person, even if they are wrong, because then they can say that they're sorry and actually hear you. Because if you're very quick to react, even if they say sorry, they might be more focused on how you reacted versus what they actually did to hurt you in the first place. Ex- yes, completely. They it's become crazy. defensive, yeah. right? And then defensive, defensive, that does not create healthy communication. Yeah, because then they're not really hearing you. They're just, that's right. They're just, it becomes a, not even about what actually happened. Yeah. It just <laughs> takes a total different spin. Okay. And then the last section I want to dive into, even though I'd love to get into them all, is family. If I get into a massive fight with my sister, what should I do? I often feel that family really knows how to push your buttons because they installed them. (laughs) That is very true. And so the beauty of this ladder of inference, right? How to have difficult conversations, it applies everywhere in your life. You know, not just with your love partner, but also with your family, with friends, with colleagues, right? And, And it's a tool, it's a tool for every part of your life. Yeah, absolutely. Before we wrap up, I want to talk about, you know, why etiquette is seen as a, ladies or women's issue do you think that finishing schools reinforce outdated gender norms um you know it's uh i like a lot of my a, a lot of criticisms i get are that finishing school is reinforcing gender norms and there are a lot of women feminists who come out and say oh you know we don't need this so I think that people who feel that finishing school and etiquette is negative to women, Mm -hmm. I think that they may be confused because they don't truly understand the spirit of etiquette, which is that it's very democratic. It's for anybody. It's for men and women. It just so happens that more women are interested in, you know, signing up for what I do. Right. But it is a good question. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really enjoyed our conversation and I've learned so much. I think that there's so much to be covered here. I feel like we didn't even get to the half of it, (laughs) but in every episode we do a segment called Al Piece 3 and it's basically my way of incorporating music into the podcast. I love music. So we have a playlist where we add songs. And if I have a guest, I usually ask them to contribute three songs and we add them to the playlist. Honestly, I have to admit, I'm really like a top 40 billboard kind of girl. I love yeah. it. <laughs> Bring it on. I love it. <laughs> so congratulations is one okay. of my favorite songs. And I mean, I loved Peaches when it came out. Peaches I know it's, it's old now, but you know, that Peaches is was great. It's a great song. And I, and I do love a lot of hip hop. Really? Yeah, I love hip hop. I mean, I love clubbing. So I love in Shanghai, there are some great hip hop clubs really? that I go to and they play all the all the US stuff. Oh, but which is my favorite one? It's so hard to pick. So this, hard I to always pick. put people on the spot with this and yeah. I'm like, if someone did this to me, I'd be annoyed because it's well, so hard to think of my favorite two. song. Let's do two. Two let's is two. perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for joining me today, Sarah Jane. I really appreciate our conversation. I learned so much from you. I know my listeners are going to learn so much from you. This is a reminder to everyone to purchase Sarah Jane's upcoming book, Mind Your Manners. It's available for pre-sale now and comes out on April 9th. I'm very excited to get my hands on this book. And I hope you feel like you were able to share with my audience. If there's anything else you do want to share, I want to give you the space to do that as well. Thank you, Ali. It's been an incredible chat. I learned stuff from you. I mean, (laughs) it's, yeah, thank you. Really, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me. To everyone listening, thank you. I love you all and I will see you next week.